Okay, so um, a very warm welcome from my side. I'm Verena Meyer. I'm a PhD student at the Research Center on Anti-Gypsyism at the University of Heidelberg. And I'm very happy to be chairing this wonderful panel with three presentations on the topic of resistance, um, female re resistance in particular. And um, we're going to start with the presentation by Una Lociondo and Caroline Francois on the topic the diverging, diverging states of Perla Golda and Nila Diamond, two post Jewish sisters in the French resistance. And I'm going to briefly present our um, lecturers today. Una Lociondo is Italian born but uh, based in Paris and holds a PhD in French literature and cultural history from the University of Palermo. She's a specialist in women's representation in the interwar period of French culture. And since 2007, she has worked as a research officer and curator of historical exhibitions in Paris at the Memorial de la Shoah. And uh, in 2018, she co-founded the association Past slash Not Past, uh, which promotes research in the field of cultural heritage. As a scientific and cultural curator for Generique, a European research center on immigration heritage, she has worked on immigrant and refugee women in France and in the 20th century, and she participated in various international conferences on this topic. Her co-presenter, Pauline Francois, is a historian in charge of the temporary and traveling exhibition at the Memorial de la Joie in Paris, and she is also an uh, exhibition curator and the author of several articles on the topic of women in the Holocaust. As a speaker, she regularly participates in the Memorial de la Shoah training program on subjects of discrimination, gender issues, and sexual violence in the context of the genocidal process. In 2016, she curated for the Memorial de la Shoah the temporary exhibition on women in the French resistance. And we're happy for your presentation and that you're here. Thank you. Sorry for my English um, <laughs> of French, so <laughs> you can imagine. Um, we start our uh, research um, related the uh, German sister when providing the exhibition, uh, Julia Perot. Photographer and resistance currently open at the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris until uh, January um, uh, 2024. Her life and photographic work are intimate, intimately connected with the link with three women. Her sister, Midla, students back. Yeah, this is this. This is Miller, uh, Sudan Spak, as a Belgium uh, resistant Argentinian killed in, uh, by the Nazi in Paris, and Jean Vercheval, who is a, fem a Belgian feminist and co founder of the Museum of the Photography in Charleroi. Both the prism of uh, woman history naturally imposes it, it, uh, itself on our studies. Thank you. Thank you. Today, uh, we will focus on the destinies of the Diamond Sisters. Uh, so, Golda Perla and Lindblad Diamant, two college two refugees in France, who both participated uh, to the France uh, to the French resistance. Uh, Twenty twenty four uh, will be a year of commemorations of uh, French liberation. Uh, and uh, next February, in uh, February in twenty twenty four, um, Misa. And Medine Manoukian, two Armenian residents, uh, will uh, entry in the, in the pantheon, in the French pantheon. So um, this, that will be uh, an opportunity to celebrate the contributions of the numerous foreigners to the French resistance. Um, also, the Memorial de la Shoah will celebrate uh, them with a new exhibit uh, starting in February uh, on the topic of the uh, foreigners uh, in, uh, in French residents. Uh, so, um, this year or last year, we, 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 without it was important to draw attention to the um, role of another forgotten 
cultural uh, different components of the resistance movement um, that is many French and foreign women in, uh, in France, Jewish or not, uh, who took part in the partisan fight for the liberation. Uh, through Mimla and uh, Perla Golda Diamant, uh, we wish to pay tribute to all these women and the resistance fighters who have long remained in the shadow of, the, uh, of our historiography focused on the role of men. Um, so, uh, Golda, Perla, and um, Mimla Diamant were born in the small town of Konchkovala. Uh, near uh, Lublin, and they were daughters of Baruch Diamond and Surat Heinfeld. Uh, it was a, um, a miner's village. Uh, their family is a large uh, part of the population in Konchkovala, uh, was, was Jewish by religion or family culture, and spoke a mixture of English and Polish. Um, the series of small houses uh, were built at the end of the previous century to accommodate a large number of mine workers uh, from the poorest rural areas of uh, the country. And this communal life um, uh, guaranteed them a, a, a degree of protection in face of the country's growing anti-Semitism. This is the house of the um, Diamond Sisters, uh, and the sister is taken by uh, Golda Perla uh, after after war. Um, so the two sisters would always remain uh, attached to this communal way of life, and will later become involved in trade union activities with the miners in um, Belgium and in France. Um, already in the centuries, uh, as young girls, they joined the new communist movement uh, and um, a repressed political activity that led Minla first, then Golda to prison in Poland. And later, uh, um, the same need of political commitment determined the two sisters' participation in French resistance. So uh, Midla, she was born on the 13 February uh, 1910, and at the age of uh, 16, she joined the Young Communist Movement, and uh, she soon had uh, the technical apparatus of the Warsaw Committee of the Communist Party, and then uh, of the uh, Young Apparatus of the Polish National Level. In uh, 1931, she was arrested by the police and uh, sent uh, to a uh, four year for uh, prison. At the advice of the Communist Party, she took the advantage of the medical leave to uh, flew uh, clandestinely to Paris in April 1933 with the help of the Red Head, uh, the name Secours Rouge, a care communist organization. Uh, she probably uh, go to Vienna first, and after she arrived in Paris. And, uh, but she was uh, with a work permit, and a temporary visa needed to be uh, renewed every three months. Uh, this is the the, the file um, of the, uh, the strangers police uh, who um, survived uh, Mila in Paris. Uh, she declared herself as a domestic servant and she worked for the Belleville uh, Workers Club. And uh, she was active in Polish communist organization in uh, Paris area. Uh, this is the, the, the file of uh, the, the, the police. We, we saw the, every three months uh, she needs to uh, have a new, uh, a new visa. And um, after the, the defeat of France in June uh, 1940 uh, and the beginning of the Nazi occupation, uh, she joined the, the resistance. She had no, um, uh, no visa. She works clandestinely uh, on the technical apparatus initially between Paris and north of France. And uh, she was a member of the communist organization of the resistance, the FTP MOE. Like many uh, strangers, women 
uh, like uh, Golda Mankic, Irma Nico, Christina Boyko, Lisa Slanyan. The FTPMO is the most important group in uh, Paris who attacked the German soldier. Um, Midla became a liaison agent with the mission of smuggling weapons, uh, leaflet and for, um, forget documents between uh, Paris, the occupy zone and the non-occupy zone, where she met again uh, her sister Julia. Uh, Midla was arrested uh, at the checkpoint on uh, chalon sur saône uh, while trying to cross the demarcation line. Uh, she was jailed in Dijon and uh, the prison in Paris. She was deported to Germany on the December 3, uh, 1942, on the Northern Naval Transport to a German prison. Like many other Jewish and communist women resistant, she was not standing uh, in the camp like the other woman uh, resistant, but she was sentenced to, to death. She was guillotined uh, on August uh, 24, 1944. She was, uh, this is the, the, the condemnation, and she was uh, post uh, after the war, she received the uh, medal, the, the Croix de Guerre, on December uh, 1947. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, so uh, about Claudia Carla, uh, from Poland to Belgium, Claudia Carla becomes Julia Pirat. Um, so, uh, Gilda Carla was arrested at the age of uh, 17 uh, for her involvement in the Polish Communist Youth Movement, and she spent four years in uh, prison. So, as her sister, in um, two years later, in 1934, uh, with help of the International Red Aid, she fled her country to join a system in the uh, refugee in France. But uh, falling ill on her way to Belgium, she had to stay in this country first. Um, she worked as a laborer and married the trade unionist Jean Pirat, and um, she obtained the Belgian citizenship. So starting from now, I will call her Julia Pirat because it's the name uh, she chose uh, during uh, the war and um, uh, the war and, and, and then later. Um, uh, at the end of the world. So in Brussels, uh, Susan Spack uh, encouraged Julia to to take photography lessons uh, and gave her the Leica camera uh, that she would never pass for. Uh, Julia Pirot attended evening classes at the School of Journalism and, and trained as a photographer. And between 1938 and 1939, she obtained the first assignment as a photojournalist, uh, and uh, her first report is a report on the Baltic States. Uh, here you have a, a, a photo, and she worked for a press agency uh, called Photovaro. Um, in May 1940, uh, following the invasion of Belgium by Nazi Germany, she fled to France and finally settled in Marseille. And she began working in an aircraft factory and as a photographer on a private page. Um, from 1942, she worked as, as a photojournalist for the local press, including several uh, journals, including uh, Le Dimanche Illustré, um, La Marseillaise, and a uh, um, political um, journal called uh, Le Midi uh, Rouge. Her reports documented the precarious living conditions of the inhabitants of the um, old um, area uh, of Marseille, and uh, also uh, this uh, unit re report on the situation of the Jewish, uh, Austrian, and German Jewish women uh, in the internment camp of Bompard. 
Uh, she worked also uh, as a sister, as a liaison officer for the um, French uh, resistance uh, for the FTP, uh, and she transported leaf plates and uh, weapons and uh, four papers. Um, on uh, August and first, twenty uh, first August, nineteen forty four. She took part in the uprising in Marseille uh, that she documented with her photographs. Um, after the war, uh, Julia Pirat uh, returned to Poland and settled in uh, Warsaw. And uh, in 1946, she produced another unique report because she could uh, document the uh, day after the Kielce program in 1946. Um, her career as a photographer known in the world, uh, the first exhibition of the Julia Pirat um, is in uh, Arl, in the International um, Photo Festival uh, in Arl in 1980. And since then, her artistic work began to be exhibited worldwide. Uh, she died in Warsaw in uh, 2000. Um, for conclusion, the, the, the two sisters in the collective uh, collective memory in the making, similar as well as um, tragically different, the sister face illustrate the multiple paths taken by Jewish women during the Second World War and the Holocaust. A better understanding of individual journey allowed to identify similarity and difference between space and time of war, despite the absence of the archive and the difficulty on tracing and noting especially when it crossed several borders. The notion of migration is important here. By placing the study in the French national context, it fits in with current question about the place and the participation of the foreigners in the resistance and the question of the notion of alien. From a specially, specifically French perspective, the fact that the women arrested and sentenced in French by the German were not executed in France like men, but in Germany. The time discrepancy in the collective memory uh, more focused on male space. Midla um, bears witness to the fact that women's faith was just as tragic. So to conclude, the, the recent rediscovery uh, because in France, the, 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 the last exhibition on Julia Pierre's work was in 30 years ago, and only uh, it, was, it was focused on main, mainly on, on the resistance period. Uh, so the recent rediscovery of rare photographic testimony by Julia Pierre illustrates how precious these sources are. Uh, and also, uh, Julia Piat was really conscious of the um, uh, importance of to of document and testify through uh, these media. Uh, in a in a in a interview uh, that she she gave uh, a few years before she died, um, when the, the the journalists asked her uh, why you documented all all the the, the all uh, everyday life in, in this uh, during the war because they could take pictures of uh, uh, every that everyday life also not not only the main uh, important um, event historical events. Uh, she the answer was I didn't think I would survive, so I wanted to record each moment of the life with a big L during the war. So, um, thank you. <laughs>
Okay, now I'm happy to introduce our second speaker, and I'm particularly happy because our next two speakers are also part of the other WISP program on creating educational material and are also in the resistance working group. And Alessandro Mata will speak on Sardinian Jewish women during the Holocaust between resistance and genocide. Alessandro Mata is the director and founder of the Sardinian Shoah Memorial Association. He is a Shoah scholar and historical researcher on the subject with a particular interest and focus on cinematography of the genocide of the Jews in the Second World War. He's a member of the Archival Experts Group of ERI, the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, and he's also a member of the Scientific Education Group of the ILMC Foundation, the Institutio di Literatura Musicale Concentration Canaria, <laughs> in Balletta Bari in Italy. He's an experienced Holocaust educator who cooperated as a participant and lecturer with the University of Florence, Yad Vashem, Memorial de la Shoah, UC um, Shoah Foundation, Anti-Defamation League, and many other organizations. He is the author of the book Racial Legislation Laws in Sardinia, 1938-1944, published in 2016. The book Ascent for a Body, Juridical Historical Analysis of Processes Against Nazi Criminals, Franz Stangel and Arius Brunner in 2017, and Sator Kalendarium from 2018. And we're welcoming you and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I must press, yes. Thank you, Verena. Uh, any specification about the book uh, uh, around the Jewish, uh, the little Jewish community in Sardinia in the Holocaust years? Uh, we have a second uh, edition that will be published in 2024 now for, uh, with uh, Juntina, that is the main uh, press uh, editor uh, of Jewish thematics uh, topics in, in Italy. Thank you and uh, welcome. My paper will be about uh, the destiny of the three Sardinian uh, Jewish women between uh, resistance and genocide, a very particular topic and uh, not so local, but also translocal or also international topic. Before I start, we must answer some important, uh, very important questions. How much were the Jews in Sardinia in 1938 at the break up of the anti-Semitic legislation by the uh, fascist regime? And what about the histories in Holocaust years? And how much the local histories connected to the Holocaust in and out also of Italy? But particularly, there was a Holocaust in Sardinia is a big question because we know that this island was a free territory after the armistice from 8th of September 1943 and was included in the South Rhine under the Allied troops control. So were not deportations from Sardinia, also by a sort of accord between German army and Allied army, and Sardinia territory was used only for passage uh, territory uh, on the way of the Corsica, where the Nazis uh, break up very, very strong uh, combats with uh, Allied and uh, partisans. Two dates are really important in the history of the Jews of Sardinia. The first date make uh, a connection with the word expulsion, and uh, it is the 1492, but in reality 1493, when the Edict of Alhambra, uh, promoted by Isabella of Castilla and Fernando d'Aragona, became application also in Sardinia, and all the Jews of Sardinia that was that to a Spanish territory were expelled from Spain. And many of the Jews established them in the North Africa, in the Balkans, particularly in Macedonia, and some also in uh, Poland. A second word, emancipation, and the second date, many important, 1848, when the Editto di Toleranza of the King of Italy, Carlo Alberto, King of Piemont and Sardinia, make the Sardinia the first free region with Piemonte that emancipated the Jews. And from the start of this day, 
we have a, a little reborn of a represence of the Jewish uh, uh, people in Sardinia, particularly um, professions uh, that uh, professional men and women that established them in uh, Sardinia, or particularly women that married not Jewish Sardinian men and established them in uh, uh, in Sardinia. We must uh, subdivide two different period also in Sardinia, the persecution years between 1938 and 1943 and the really Holocaust years between 1943 and 1945. And if we can solve documents like this from 19 June 1943, that is the sense of uh, the census of the uh, Jews in Cagliari to uh, take them to four labor camps established by the fascism for all the Jews of Italy. We can see that in uh, Cagliari also the majority of the Jews were women, uh, Jewish women married with not Jewish men. My paper will focus on three personal stories, not local but uh, transnational. Uh, and uh, also translocal. Magda Sledzinger, the first uh, history uh, is connected uh, between Sassari and Catania, in particularly the resistance period held uh, attention in Catania. Magda Marta Lewis in Pau, uh, which a personal resistance history took place in Rome between 1943 and 1944. And finally, Liana of Magia, whose uh, resistance period uh, took uh, place in Florence and also in all Tuscany. Magda Sledzinger is a Polish woman born in Lodz in 1913, is the son of uh, Tirza and uh, Tirza Segal and Israel uh, Sledzinger, and uh, her family had uh, many connections with the Zionist movements from Lodz, particularly her mother, uh, Tirza uh, Segal is the cousin of Sokolov, the uh, main uh, philosopher of the Zionist movement. And in the meantime, when Magda studied medicine and uh, uh, became in Italy one of the first uh, medical women diplomed in Italy, and uh, knew her, uh, me, uh, her husband, Franco Ottolenghi, that uh, is uh, uh, um, assistant in dermatology that took uh, work in uh, the University of Sassari in the north of Sardinia. The parents of uh, Magda, in the meantime, established them in the issue, in the first enucleum of the state of Israel, but for climatic inadaptations, they decide in the summer of 1939 to return in Poland, in Lodz and will be their destiny. Here we can uh, see Magda in Alghero, a town uh, in the province of Sassari in the 30s. And when Magda became in Sassari one of the first uh, medical women in Italy, the parents of Magda are imprisoned before in the Lodge ghetto and after, uh, because uh, they have uh, many, many uh, familiars in the Warsaw ghetto, asked to be transferred from the Lodge ghetto to the Warsaw ghetto. And this uh, transfer took place, and the parents of Magda uh, sent about 50 uh, about letters and postcards to her son and uh, uh, her husband, Franco Tolendi, from the Warsaw ghetto to Sassari. This correspondence is very, very precious, and uh, particularly documents. And there are the last traces of the parents of Magda that will be deported and killed in Treblinka Extermination Center in July 1942. In the meantime of all of this, thank you of the courage of Magda that insisted to uh, save the position, the work position of her husband. Franco Tolenghi obtained a certificate uh, of Arianization from the uh, Notaio Antonio uh, Porquedo in Nuoro. And with this certificate can uh, give a competition for a retribute assistant in the university that won and uh, took away, they took away from Sardinia to Sicily. And it is in Sicily that uh, uh, will, uh, will uh, rule the particular role in a resistance of Magda Slezinger because Franco is uh, taken by the Nazis 
for the first great uh, mass murder of the Nazis uh, took in Italy, precisely in Castiglione di Sicilia, the 12th of August, 1943. Also in this uh, sector, the courage of Magda will be great because uh, Magda, on the board of the mass grave buried by a group of men, uh, Franco, uh, her husband included, in preparation to be shot, hide herself like a German woman in loving to the German soldier at the head of the firing squadron and uh, can put away her husband from this execution and save his husband's life. Uh, we have a reconstruction about all of this, not only by the memories of Magda Slezinger, uh, collected by her son, um, but also by an audio interview uh, released by Franco Tolenghi in Milano in July 2000 to Liliana Picciotto for the Centro di Documentazione Ebraica Contemporanea. Uh, the family in uh, Sassari survived, in uh, Sicily survived the war, and after the war, they established in Milan, where Franco and Magda died in different uh, years, until they discovered by her son uh, the, uh, about the, the letters and the postcards sent from uh, the Varsar Ghetto to uh, Sassari, a, a very precious document that connect Sardinia with the uh, extermination of the Polish Jews. The second history of resistance connected to the Holocaust and Sardinia is Marta Lewis in Pau. Marta Lewis in Pau, this very beautiful woman that you can see in this picture, known also by Marta Lilac for art name, it was an opera singer, a great famous opera singer born in New York in the United States in 1888 with a great career of uh, uh, opera singer uh, in front of her. And for love, only for love, decided to abandon this career and to uh, marry age in the St. Paul Cathedral in London. His, as her husband, Antonio Pau, a very rich man from Cagliari, and established with him in Cagliari as a uh, casalinga, we can uh, talk in Italy, in Italian. They had uh, one son, Pierpaolo, Pierpaolo Pau, a Jewish himself. And uh, at the breakup of the anti-Semitic legislation, also Marta with uh, uh, hit by the uh, uh, legi anti-Hebraic of the fascism. And uh, he, she took her son before in Florence in a college. And when he came in 1941 to take her son to go uh, to return in Sardinia, they found the collegement with Sardinia blocked and they the, they taken the uh, uh, very courageous decision to hide in Rome, in Rome with fake documents uh, given by her uh, to her and her son by uh, Antonio Strazzera Pernici Amedeo Strazzera Perniciani, sorry, that was also him of Sardinian origin. It was the first director of uh, uh, Regina Celi uh, prison in Rome. Uh, with a uh, surname changed from Lewis in Lecis, a sort of a similar Sardinian uh, surname, and they hide in an apartment of Via del Tempio Dure in front of the main synagogue of Rome. Uh, she assisted to the uh, Great Roundup of 16 October 1943, and she assisted also to other roundups, and particularly uh, they, uh, she was, Marta, very courage, during the roundup after Via Rasella attentats, because during the research by the Nazis to the Jews to add uh, to the uh, 30 uh, hundred people that will be shot in the Artin Caves massacre, uh, during this roundup in the ghetto and this research in the ghetto quartier in Rome, Marta distracted two Nazi soldiers that knocked the door talking with them in uh, Viennese, Viennese uh, di dialect, because uh, she recognized, uh, she, she lived before the, the war for many, many years in uh, Vienna, and she talked with them in German Viennese uh, dialect and distract these two uh, Nazi soldiers, permitting many people hiding in the palace, in the building to escape from the roundup and uh, uh, include his son, because um, uh, his son Pierpaolo 
uh, was in uh, in, in an age to to um, can be uh, taken up also him by the Nazis. Uh, they survived the until the liberation of Rome in June 1944, and they returned in uh, Sardinia from Napoli. Uh, Marta, she died in Cagliari in uh, 1953. And he was very young, but uh, she was not so good uh, by the health, and she died uh, very young in 1953, uh, uh, 10 years after these events. The third uh, resistance history is a particularly uh, and a great history that connect also about the history of a family, of a Jewish family that is rediscovering herself and her Jewish roots. And uh, I refer to Geiringer family, Liana Aufrichtig Magia. Uh, she is the son of Augusta Geiringer uh, Aufrichtig. That is, she is the last son, the last of seven sons of Eugenio Geiringer. Eugenio Geiringer. He was a very important imprenditorial man of the Jewish community of Trieste. Uh, we can, we can uh, tell uh, about him, about uh, the Silvio Berlusconi of the 19th century in Trieste. Uh, but she was a family that uh, took away from the Jewish religion uh, in uh, 19th century too. They were all Catholics. Uh, also their seven son, Elisa, Emilia, Riccardo, Agle, Pietro Nabucco and Augusta. Augusta married uh, a Jewish man uh, from um, Czechoslovak Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, uh, Salomon of Richtig. Uh, this man abandoned her and her son. And Liana, Liana married a Sardinian, a not Jewish man, the doctor Vincenzo Magia, and established herself in Cagliari. But in the years of the war, in 1940, uh, 1941, they go in uh, Florence to the mother, to Augusta, and uh, in Florence, when they start in 1943, the roundups against the Jews in November 1943, uh, very courageously, Liano Frictic Magia organize uh, a sort of uh, uh, carry uh, trained by horse with her sons and her mother, Augusta, and uh, took away from uh, Florence and make up and down in uh, all the Tuscany until the end of the war. Uh, she saved in this modality her, her two sons and were joined also by her husband, Vincenzo Magia, that abandoned Tirana after the 8th of September 1943, by walk escaped from Tirana and joined his family in Tuscany. A very incredible story, but no one of the Geiringer Magia family know about they were Jews. It was only uh, thanks to me that I searched connections and uh, I researched the history of Liano Frictig Magia that I took uh, the last year the contacts with Laura Magia, the son of Liana and the grandson of Augusta, and I interviewed uh, Lia uh, Laura Magia in an audio interview released to me in 2021. And thanks to me, Dario Bartolini, another grandson of Garinger family, discovered to have a, a familiar in Sardinia. No one know about that Augusta was uh, uh, married with a Sardinian man, and no one know about uh, Laura, about Liana, etc., etc., and only like, uh, thank you of me, uh, Laura can know the rest of his family, the his Jewish family in Firenze and uh, took uh, contacts with uh, her cousin, Dario Bartolini. But another very important connection about his history is the connection between Liana Fictig Magia and her cousin, Laura Geiringer. Laura Geiringer, she's the son of Pietro Nabucco Geiringer, uh, it is uh, the only of the part of the uh, Geiringer family that will be deported because Laura, her uh, father Pietro, and her mother Vivante will be deported from uh, Porto Gruaro in Auschwitz in 1943. Uh, in 1944, uh, they arrived in Auschwitz. And probably Laura, that is the all survivor of her family, 
uh, was victim of the experimentation, medical experimentation of uh, uh, Karl Klauberg. Uh, we can uh, tell about this because Laura Geringer dead in uh, Trieste in uh, 51. And in 56, Erma Langbein asked to Laura, he, uh, he didn't know that uh, Laura was dead, to uh, witness in uh, the Auschwitz trial against uh, Karl Klauberg, but also in the target book of, uh, in the uh, journal of uh, Laura Geringer, we have pages uh, broken away. And we have uh, the possibility that Liana and Laura were in contact after the Holocaust, because in their interview the day I, uh, that he, she released to me, the son of Liana, Laura, watching the picture of Lia Laura Geiringer, tell to me that uh, her mother uh, tell him uh, very often about a cousin called Laura, like her, uh, that she escaped from the Holocaust because a beautiful Nazis uh, talk uh, in love uh, uh, with her. But we know today that Laura Geiringer in her uh, uh, journal in the late Dead Memories talk about that uh, to escape the bad situation around her in the nights in the barracks of Auschwitz, uh, dream about uh, uh, love histories uh, with the Nazis to, to run away from this uh, uh, koshmar, from, from this incubo. And so uh, we are uh, the certain that Liana and Laura were uh, in contact also after the Holocaust and before the death of her. So these are three very, very important history that connect uh, Sardinia, not only with the Holocaust, but also with the resistance and the new concept of resistance held by historians like Liliana Picciotto. Salvarsi, save themselves, because in Italy, in particular, many of them, the Jews say the same. Thank you very much for attention. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our third speaker on the panel on resistance, Sylvia Simanska Smolkin, The Fabrics of Resistance, the Contribution of Female Jewish Couriers in the Second World War. And I'm also going to introduce our speaker. Sylvia is a researcher at the Department of Historical and Contemporary Studies at Zürichton University in Stockholm where she conducts research on Jewish couriers and their role in establishing contacts and networks between Jewish communities during the Second World War. The project is supported by the Foundation for Baltic and Eastern European Studies, and she was a postdoctoral research fellow in Holocaust studies at the Hugo Valentin Center in Uppsala University, and the recipient of the International Ephraim in the Urba Postdoctoral Fellowship in Jewish Studies awarded by the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture. She earned her PhD in History and Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto, and her dissertation examined the complicity of the Polish policemen in the Holocaust in occupied Poland. Dr. Szymanska uh, Smolkin has international teaching and research expertise at several universities and institutions in the history of Eastern Europe and the Holocaust. She has taught at the University of Toronto, York University in Toronto, University of Warsaw, and Uppsala University. Her research and writing have been supported by external funding from various federal and private organizations, including the Social Science and Humanities, Research Council, the Canadian Friends of the Hebrew University, and the Conference of Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. And we are very warm welcome to you, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. No, sir. 
Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, in the days of destruction and revolt, Sylvia Lubetkin wrote the following about female couriers. Lonka Pozbrodska, Tema Schneiderman, Havka Polman, Rysia, and Tania Beatis from Dron, Tosia Altman from Hashomer Hatzair, Soika Erlichman from Gordonia, Hala Schipper from Akiva, and others, served as a liaison between the ghettos and the various provinces. They risked their lives scores of times as they traveled from place to place. After each mission, they rested for a few days and then set out once more. One cannot possibly describe this work of organizing Jewish resistance or the uprising itself without mentioning the role of these valiant women. Um, these are just a few names of courageous young women whose clandestine work was crucial in various aspects of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust. There were many more, some less known or forgotten female couriers because they did not survive to talk about their wartime experiences. Their contributions had enormous significance in preparing for active resistance, even though most of them did not participate in direct combat. In fact, in Warsaw and Białystok, the couriers were ordered to leave the ghettos as their work on the Orient side was considered more valuable. The notion of fabric used in the title of my presentation reflects the historically female endeavor of interview, interview, inter weaving, excuse me, uh, disparate uh, threads to form a stronger hold. It also alludes to Jewish resistance, taking many forms, often involving clandestine efforts that either contributed to or supported more explicit measures such as armed combat. Although one can identify a plurality of activities, the lines blur as most actions involved considerable risk and were active and potentially conspicuous. While active resistance has historically been the domain of armed combat, taking an intersectional approach, which includes the politics of gender, the social domain, and psychological and philosophical considerations around power and perception, disrupt a simplistic view of hierarchical contributions. Rather than a vertical notion of what is passive or active, we can entertain a more horizontal definition by amplifying the necessary contributions the female careers made, which were instrumental in building the resistance movement. In this paper today, I aim to highlight the queer's role in establishing contact between Jewish communities in the territories of pre-war Poland their contributions to raising awareness of the mass murder of Jews and the establishment of resistant movements in ghettos. Um, the stories about Jewish female couriers are important for their inherent significance and contribute to, on, to the ongoing scholarship that questions and attempts to redefine our understanding and prioritization of these historical narratives. Examining the stories and context of female career's contributions creates a more three-dimensional picture of the various fabrics that held together and supported this movement. Rereading and articulating the specific events that informed changes in attitudes about the extent of Nazi policies and actions, as well as the very practical nature of the career's roles in smuggling arms, food, money, and communiques is essential to scrutinize for potential biases. For example, Activities that may have been peripheral and therefore less central to resistant narratives, through a renewed lens, demand a rethinking of these hierarchical narratives as they involve extraordinary levels of risk, coordination, and subtlety. The articulation of these narratives is inexorably tied to gender. For example, historian Avi Horonen writes, the initial historiography of the Jewish uprising was written by women who tended to minimize their own role in the events and emphasize their partner. The later historiography was written by men, and again, the role of women was reduced. It seems that the time has come to give this woman their due. Uh, and here, just see a picture of a few of those young women who were couriers in the territories of. Um, Occupy Poland. Uh, this is a false identity papers of Vlad Tamid, who was a courier for the Bund. Uh, and this is the area uh, I'm in my research concerned with five ghettos in three different uh, occupation uh, or administrative zones of occupied Poland. 
um, despite the fact that the work of Curious was recognized by the wartime chroniclers of Jewish experience under the German occupation, such as Ringelblum, uh, Emanuel Ringelblum, and by the surviving resistance fighters Jalubetkin and Ishak Zuckerman, the activities of Jewish couriers remained largely left out from the historiography of Jewish responses during the Second World War until recently. Most of the couriers active during the war were women due to specific dangers awaiting Jewish men traveling illegally. Couriers came from various underground political parties and youth organizations. The task of the couriers depended on the current German policies against the Jews and reflected the youth movement's reaction to different stages of persecution. They developed from establishing contacts between communities to spreading news about mass killings. Following the German and Soviet occupation of Poland in the Second World War, couriers set out to remote Jewish communities to reestablish and maintain connections and to facilitate the restructuring of political and youth organizations. Their work was critical to the success of information exchanges between disconnected Jewish communities. The communication that the couriers transmitted between the ghettos helped gather vital information about German anti-Jewish policies in occupied Poland and the Soviet Union. The couriers enabled the exchange of illegal publications between the ghettos, held meetings to organize local programs, and facilitated educational seminars and social activity in the communities they visited. Kruka Putnicka from Kachalutz, a later Jewish uh, fighting organization, helped to coordinate the movement's operation and to establish movement branches. She was one of the most successful couriers. Sylvia Lubetkin described Putnicka in the following words. Rumka, who didn't look particularly Aryan and had sad Jewish eyes, traveled everywhere and there wasn't a place she didn't reach. She went as far as Vilna, Kovel, and Benjamin. No other liaison from Warsaw ever made it to cover or breath. She overcame every obstacle. We found that if we sent messengers to the ghettos to warn the Jews of the approaching danger of extermination, we could help them to organize and resist. We would be able to save Jewish lives. We might succeed in establishing a Jewish defense force, and perhaps some Jews would manage to escape into the forest. Indeed, the mere arrival of one of our liaisons was a cause of celebration in the ghetto. Hafka Polman was a member of the Dror movement before the war. During the occupation, she began to deliver movement publications and messages to the members in the general government. The purpose of her trips was to meet with people, maintain contact, and tell them what was happening in the center and various branches. Polman recalled, 16 and a half, 17 year old me was expected to transmit information about an active center, about ideas on resistance, report that there still was a movement, that not everyone was depressed. Lonka Kozibrowska became one of the most active couriers of Hachalutz and Dror throughout occupied Poland. She maintained contact between ghettos in Warsaw, Grodno, and Vilna. Several times she accompanied Yitzhak Superman and others. She carried newspapers, documents, and money. She also transferred important papers from Krakow to Warsaw, from Oynek Shabbos, the Warsaw underground. Uh, the also ghetto underground archive. Heike Grossman uh, from Hashomer Hatzair, originally from Białystok, was instrumental in maintaining connections between the Białystok, Warsaw, and Vilna ghettos. She traveled to Białystok to set up an underground organization in the ghetto to fight the Germans. When the mass murder began in the East in the summer of 1941, the couriers started carrying news about the massacres and urge resistance activities. In October and December 1941, emissaries of the Zionist youth movement left Vilna for the Grodno, Białystok, and Warsaw ghettos with news of the mass murder, mass murders in Lithuania and to inspire resistance. Tomasz Schneiderman was among the first people who brought the news about the killing of Vilna Jews in Ponare to Warsaw, possibly already in October of 1941. Other couriers were sent to Vilna to confirm the news, evaluate the situation, and bring more details. Among others, uh, Lonka Kozibrowska from Kaputnicka and Kosia Altman. Heika Grossman also arrived from Vilna and brought more information about the massacres. Avka Foman recalls that because the news about killings in the East 
was hard to accept even within youth organizations. Their leadership requested additional details concerning what was transpiring in various other cities. In order for the information to be trustworthy, she said, it needed to be gathered by our own people. Other couriers brought news of killings elsewhere. Lisa Chapman, a, a communist, became aware of the Swanian massacre in July 1941 when she happened to be in the area. She tried to make people aware of the killings there, but no one believed her. Soon, the refugees uh, started arriving from the Vartaland, which was in the territories incorporated in the Third Reich, as well as couriers uh, would bring information about the killing center in Haumno. The couriers were also able to locate survivors of massacres and receive the reports. Often the couriers were the only eyewitnesses to the destruction of small Jewish communities within the general government. While on a mission, Havka Polman and Prunka Potnitska witnessed the liquidation of the ghetto in Trubieshu, a town in southeastern Poland in June 1942. And they also learned about a new camp that opened, Sobibur. Upon the return, the couriers were able to report on the situation in the ghettos and assess the chances of creating underground resistance organizations there. Polman recalled, we returned to Warsaw and described what we had seen to our friends. This was the first reliable information about the deportation of Jews from Eastern Poland for extermination. I felt they did not believe us. Reportedly, Grunka Putnicka witnessed the liquidation of many communities and relayed so many reports of deportation that she called herself a grave digger. In preparation for the armed struggle, the roles of couriers changed yet again, and they become involved in other tasks, such as acquiring weapons and smuggling them into the ghetto, establishing contacts with the Polish underground and organizing places to stay on the Aryan side. Krumka Potnitska brought weapons into the Warsaw ghetto by smuggling them in a sack of potatoes. Havka Polman and Tomasz Schneiderman smuggled grenades into the Warsaw ghetto by hiding them in their undergarments. After January 1943, Bronia Kribanski was the only draw courier on the Aryan side of Białystok. Her task included purchasing weapons and delivering them to Białystok and to the ghetto, gathering intelligence, maintaining communication with other ghettos, and finally concealing the underground archives of the Białystok ghetto created by Tsvi Mersik and Mordechai Tenenbaum. Couriers provided logistical support for other leaders of the Jewish resistance working on the Aryan side and acted as liaisons between members of resistance groups scattered on the Aryan side. Jewish female couriers were also crucial in maintaining contacts with the Polish underground. After the majority of Polish Jews had already been murdered in killing centers, the couriers focused on rescuing adults and children by helping them to escape to the Aryan side, providing them with false identity papers, securing apartments, visiting them, and providing financial support to them and the rescuers. They also maintained contact with Jewish partisan units hidden in the forest. For example, Leyash Silverstein traveled to those groups hiding in the Shkub forest after the war Soviet uprising. Some couriers joined partisan groups and continued to act as couriers for the partisan units. Others worked from the Aryan side. Havka Polman's job was also to move members of the underground from the ghettos to the forest so they could join with the partisans who were active there. Um, to conclude, the clandestine nature of the couriers' activity throughout World War II and the predominance of women's contributions have resulted in not only an overlooked aspect of Jewish resistance, but a tendency towards prioritizing particular narratives and elevating certain forms of activity to a higher status. Most, if not all actions involved considerable risk and by that logic were active and had the real potential to be seen. The task carried out by the couriers throughout the war prepared the foundation for the armed resistance in the ghettos. The work of the couriers broadens our understanding of the mechanism of survival and resistance toward the Nazi regime's genocidal policies. A careful assessment of their activities elaborates an important narrative that deepens our understanding of the highly supportive and influential nature of their activities. And it is arguable 
that without the foundation of their dangerous work, important bodies of knowledge and elaborate forms of resistance might not have come into being. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Like, thanks to everyone who spoke um, in the panel on resistance. Um, before we go into a like, round of questions and comments, I would like to make a few um, like summary remarks because I think the panel was very well organized in terms that the presentation spoke to each other and interconnected quite well. So what we've seen here in this panel is um, women who were persecuted as Jews and slash or communists um, and how they use their agency and um, like agency in the terms of like using one scope of action, giving in a certain space where massive imbalance of power um, exists, where women Great. Like they were usually on several grounds, not just um, because they were Jews or communists, but also because they were women. And uh, in these spaces, they nevertheless found various forms to resist. And uh, we also, in the different papers, um, we saw various. Yeah, forms and definitions of resistance, and uh, Alessandro in his last work uh, pointed out to the like most basic form um, of like yeah saving one's own life as a form of resistance. And uh, another common topic is that um, in in these papers we saw that human didn't act in isolation but in larger networks. And um, I was surprised to see because um, all of you shaped their biographies and um, elaborated quite well on their upbringing. And um, yeah, I, I myself was wondering, and maybe you can elaborate on that, um, like how much um, their previous like pre-war experience of uh, being active members of youth organizations or like you mentioned trade unions, how much that shaped like their later actions uh, during the time of um, persecution and their forms of resistance. Um, and when we look at or when we situate these women in larger networks, societal uh, networks, um, I found quite striking uh, what Alessandro um, mentioned that a lot of the Sardinia women lived in intermarriage. Relationships, yes. and uh, maybe you can also like the uh, reality point out more to like their relationships and their status because being in an intermarriage relationship also enables these women to navigate to other social groups, like um, maybe more easily. Um, and um, the transgression of uh, social groups as well as like geographical boundaries was also a common topic. Like my all of you mentioned migration, and um, yeah, I was wondering and um, some um, biographies, uh, biographies you saw like passing as a so-called alien uh, woman as a strategy for um, moving. Um, more freely and um, transgressing like the uh, faces and borders. Um, and here I was wondering, maybe you can elaborate on that, um, whether there's a specific gender aspect, that it was for women more easy to pass uh, than men, because like men were recruited to the army usually. And um, so, yeah, maybe you have ideas. And finally, I thought it was quite striking that in most of these biographies, we saw that the women during the war were already mm, very keen on documenting the crimes and preserving the history for the future. Um, and many of them um, also like were eyewitnesses in trials or later on documented and. Um, spoke about it, so maybe, yeah, that's also a common topic. So if you have a few more comments on, on my family, um, I'd be happy to hear it. 
About the mixed uh, marriage uh, situation, it depends uh, family by family. Because, uh, for example, in the case of Liana of Rictic Magia, we have the encounter between two uh, categories of the victims of the Nazi fascism. We are not uh, only the Jews, taken also if they are not Jews by the 19th century and exterminated also then. And the Journal of Laura Geringer is many, many full of information about that because after the arrest in December 1943, they are watched by suspects, by the other members of the Venice Jewish community because they are converted by a lot of ER, why, but they are not watched like Jews by the other members. But in the case of Liana and Fritti Magia, we have also the memory of the internat militari italiani, uh, because after the 8th of September 1933, the army, the Italian army, uh, was uh, abandoned by the, the king of Italy uh, and uh, in a situation of abandon all over the Europe, uh, not only in Italy, but also in, a, in Cephalonia, also in the Balkans, etc., and the uh, US band of Liano Fritti Magia escaped from Tirana, where the Italian soldiers were all killed in all the incredible situations. So we have the encountering of these two memories. So it depends, it depends category by, by, by category, because also in the case of Liano Fritti Magia, also the US band risked to, to be killed by, by the Nazis and their collaborators. Uh, the strategy, the, the question is that uh, for many uh, time in Italy, uh, the situation was uh, we have only 70,000, 7,000 uh, Jews deported and killed from Italy. The Jewish community was around 30,000 person, uh, 35,000 person. The majority of the Jews were saved in Italy. But uh, in proportion, we have not the same number of rights of nations. And uh, so when the historian Liliana Picciotto start his research about the Jews from Italy saved during 1943-1945, she discovered another story that mainly time were the Jews that saved and sent with uh, institution, Jewish institution like uh, the Delazem, that was uh, still uh, clandestinely open, uh, but uh, also by themselves. And so they changed the, the title of his publications uh, with the, the term Salvarsi, uh, how to save themselves, because in, in many cases, the Italian Jews save themselves without the, the right use, without, or sometimes with the right use, but in a particular situation when the right use uh, or the person that we can suspect can be declared right use by Yad Vashem. In, in the case of Martha Lewis, we are working to, to uh, making a, a declaration of right use for An Anedo Strazera Perniciani, uh, but until now we have not results. Uh, but in, in the case of Martha, the, the right use person, the not bystander person, is in a net where there are particularly the, the Jews that save themselves or save also other peoples like Marta in the in the Via del Tempio Duer in during the roundup for the Arthur King Caves massacre. So uh, it, it depends. It depends by situation by situation. The, the Holocaust is a really big uh, cosmos, is a really big puzzle and uh, is a complex situation that uh, must be reconstructed uh, piece by piece and archive by archive. Thank you for your questions and comments, Corina. Um, so yes, the, the belonging, uh, the membership in youth organizations pre-war had uh, enormous significance for the activities of those young women. Um, 
they could rely on the networks and they did go on those missions on behalf of their youth organizations. They could fall back, uh, they had the support. Uh, sometimes they travel in pairs, usually they would travel uh, alone. Uh, but what I've seen in their memoirs or diaries and testimonies is that um, even though the life in the ghetto was horrible, uh, the danger that they were facing, passing as non uh, Jewish, Polish women, uh, and the stress connected with that was enormous. That they actually looked forward to returning back to the ghetto, no matter the conditions, to be with their groups where they could socialize, they could support each other, um, they could rely on each other. Um, many of those women already uh, held leadership positions uh, in their youth organizations before the war. Um, and in many of those organizations, the roles of men and women were quite equal, and there was even leadership B uh, in case the men would be conscripted to the Polish army. Um, uh, so they they were they were in position of some power and um, agency. Um, women's passing, yes. So uh, when I started doing my research. Um, the, I realized that most of my subjects would be women. Uh, I will research male queers as well, but because of the dangers uh, that a man, Jewish man, would face leaving the ghetto when it was not um, allowed for Jews, um, it was uh, men were expected to be working. Uh, a young woman traveling alone would raise less, uh, fewer suspicions. Uh, they could not be easily uh, discovered as Jewish person in face of males. It would be a quick examination. Um, um, and uh, another factor is that a lot of Jewish women in Poland spoke Polish language because they attended Polish uh, public schools. The sons of families would go to Jewish religious schools uh, while the girls would go to Polish school, so they were exposed to the Polish language. Often they spoke without an accent, which helped. Um, some of those girls had close friends. Uh, before the war, they could learn customs of uh, Polish um, society. Um, so that, that really helped. And documenting questions. Uh, there is one book. Um, one thing that was written uh, during the war by Gustav Brenda Davidson. Uh, she did not survive the war. Uh, she was uh, from Krakow. Um, and she, she, she was killed, but she, when she was uh, held in prison uh, between interrogations, between the tortures, she would write the history of the resistance movement in Krakow uh, on pieces of toilet paper or whatever paper she could. And if she was, uh, if she was not in shape because she was reading so much, she would dictate uh, to her inmates and those um, texts survived. Uh, and I already mentioned the Couriers food report on the liquidations of ghettos in, uh, in Poland. Um, some of those reports found their way to the underground uh, Rindelblum archive of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, so we can see uh, those reports written at the time when uh, the liquidations were happening. But it was one of the, uh, especially at the end when it was, uh, everyone was aware that there was no chance of surviving. Uh, and there were archives in the Bielska Ghetto or Warsaw Ghetto. The police also had a role in securing uh, Bronka Tibanski removed. Uh, the archives of the Ghost and Bell uh, to the Aryan side, uh, and most of it um, survived. There are some parts that didn't survive, but a lot of it did survive the war, thanks to, to one of the couriers. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, uh, we can say that in the, in the case of the um, theaters. Uh, their uh, political commitments in Poland uh, plays a crucial role in, uh, in their destinies uh, during uh, the world. It 
was a sort of training for uh, these two um, women in different countries. And uh, it's also, yeah, in, that's why we call this, it's the diverging case, because in one case, Julia survives, but not Mingla. And uh, it's also because, um, and I have a question for you, Sylvia. Um, it's not, um, in the case of Mimla, for instance, uh, we have witnesses that uh, told us that she was not just uh, a liaison agent, but she was a leader of the uh, French resistance uh, movement and the, above all for the organization of the network in the south of France. And that's why uh, she was arrested. So um, the political uh, thing uh, in, in in some cases was also the reason why uh, people were uh, controlled and uh, and arrested and deported. Uh, and yes, the importance of the network too, because. Uh, uh, for instance, Julia uh, in Belgium, she married a Belgian uh, trade unionist. Uh, it was a, a fake marriage just to obtain uh, the papers, uh, and that's why she 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 survives. Uh, and uh, yes, the, the they come they come in the in France and in Belgium um thanks to a network and the, the network is very important in, in their destinies. So my question for you, Silvia, was uh, uh in your research uh, have found um you, you uh, it's interesting that you say that these women had uh leading roles in the uh, political organization before war, but what about the resistance movement? Uh, have they uh, lead for uh, to or not, not so much. Uh, so that changed, and even when they uh, had the res the leadership position, that did not translate to the role in the armed resistance. There were some of the couriers, for example, uh, from Kapotnitska who died in the Belgian uh, revolt. Um, but usually, uh, at that point. That there would be more assisting roles, so it would fall back a little bit onto the feminine traditional roles, uh, and especially after the um, the revolt, when they were securing uh, apartments, uh, helping others. Um, so we we know about some of them who did uh, participate in the combat and had some more important positions, but that was uh, very rare. Uh, usually, it it were the men. Who, who are in charge of the armed combat, not women. But they contributed immensely to make that happen by smuggling the weapon, uh, gathering intelligence, uh, but not so much involved in the direct fight. Any other any more questions? Yeah. Thank you so much. This uh, was a very precious window into into the past, and now we also talked about the the previous years and how it's all connected. Uh, and what I'm interested in is post war le legacy, meaning uh, 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 that I want to ask you, maybe oh, maybe whoever is up for the answer. Uh, so, how was this uh, Jewish women resisted legacy preserved or continued? Um, I'm guessing that it um, is different in different countries, different political contexts and so on. So I would like to hear a little bit more about that. And also, was the status of that um, legacy connected somehow to 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 uh, the persons being women or Jewish? or uh, So basically, how did you come to all this? Was it simple? Is it a part of a continual educational line or memory line or or it was a little bit more difficult uh, so there were 
some writings that uh, were uh, works that were written right after the war. Um, the problem with many of those sources is that those couriers who survived, uh, mostly Zionist uh, youth organization members, they left for Palestine and then uh, Israel. Um, and a lot of the sources that were created were in Hebrew or are in Hebrew and they are not translated. Uh, so it's not that there was no information, the accessibility uh, was um, challenging. Uh, there are some, I think Heike Grossman's book was published decades after, in English after she wrote uh, in Hebrew. Uh, there were some testimonies in Polish. Um, and I guess there was not that much interest um, in hearing the female perspective because the history was first written by the men. Uh, or in some cases, they did not emphasize their participation in the beginning. And sometimes it's even hard to look through some testimonies because I know there is a courier, but she talks about everything else for 80 pages. And then there's a casual remark, oh, I was a courier, not much detail. Uh, and then it continues finally to, to a description uh, of her activities, but very often it was not emphasized. Uh, I think that a lot of attention was paid first to those who did not survive, who contributed uh, as a kind of memorializing uh, of their dead um, comrades. And only later on uh, with the oral testimonies, they, they started talking more about their own role and um, emphasizing or bringing it more to life. Uh, about after the war, it was very difficult. And also in this fact, uh, it changed family by family. For example, uh, about Martha Lewis and Powell, the unique uh, uh, witness that uh, they live uh, they release um, a registration on a disc that she sent to her family in America, in the United States, after the liberation of Rome. Because someone of the American embassy go to, to Rome, search Martha, and uh, join Martha. Uh, your family uh, know about you were in Rome uh, with your son. They are searching you if you are safe. Uh, because they know about the, the Holocaust, about the extermination camps. And Marta uh, registered uh, this uh, disc with her uh, uh, voice, uh, reconstructing all the period of the Nazi occupation of Rome, the, 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 the roundups, uh, the deportations, but how herself saved her and her son. But it's a private uh, document uh, sent to her family in America, and today is in the hand of um, the grandson, uh, Donatella Paul Lewis, and uh, uh, is not a public uh, document. So, uh, in many times, the memories are internal to the families. In other times, uh, in the case of the family that are not Jews from before the Holocaust, this uh, situation is hide, is hide to, to the sons. Uh, when they uh, talk, uh, when Liana, after the war, talk uh, about the Holocaust years and about Trieste, about the Jewish community to his mother, they talk uh, alone, they took away their sons and talk in Trieste uh, local language to to didn't uh, can understand by their sons. So when, when I wrote, uh, to the son of Liana. Liana was uh, surprised because I showed her the documents and she didn't know that her mother was uh, registered also in Cagliari because we were in Florence. I don't know that uh, there are the registrations of mama in Cagliari. Uh, only after the, the, the death of his mother in 1999, uh, Laura Magia had a connection of uh, the Jewish of her mother. Uh, roots uh, receiving a letter from a Jewish organization about the selling uh, and the reputation of the house of uh, her uh, grandfather, Salomon of Rick, that, that was in French during the Holocaust year, was in, uh, um, I don't remember now the, the locality, 
uh, this uh, single house was uh, uh, sold by a Jewish organization to the uh, sons and the uh, grandsons and also the sons of uh, Liana. Uh, but now is a uh, sold this uh, this uh, house, uh, Montmorency. This house of Montmorency, because Solomon of Rictikis was in Paris during the Holocaust year. Uh, we don't know uh, how he survived the Holocaust, but he survived, uh, uh, probably hide in Paris in Montmorency. So the situation changed family by family by family. Uh, also in the case of Franco Tolenghi, uh, they know that uh, are Jewish, uh, and uh, also that there are the fair of a return of the antisemitism, of a new breakup of antisemitism, because Franco Tolenghi concert and achieved very, very uh, kindly his uh, certificate of Aryanization. Uh, and uh, he's, he conserved that because uh, uh, he hide that because if return the hate against the Jews, I have this certificate. But uh, only when uh, the son the, her son discovered the, the postcards and the letters from Russia ghetto to Sassari, this story break up. So it, it depends. After the war, uh, it was a particular situation. And uh, very, very few people write their memories, and particularly resistance memories. Yeah, so uh, Julia Perez died in the 2000s, so uh, how life after war is a um, <laughs> long <laughs> uh, story. But uh, yeah, what, I, we, what we can say that she was... So first of all, the YouTube combat Poland. Uh, this choice shocked some of our visitors. <laughs> uh, but uh, she... Uh, was really linked to the Communist Party and between 46 and 48, Kerensky was uh, uh, at the government and so she had a lead role in this period and she was the director of the um, a military photography agency in Poland during 46 and 48 to train uh, the new um, military generation of photographers. Um so she, she chose uh the party uh till the end of her life, even um with after the different political changes, but she was really linked to this party that yeah, thanks to this network uh, she survived. Um and uh as she was really also, she tried several experiences in uh, 57. She spent uh, one year in uh, Israel to live in uh, in a kibbutz because she was really affected by uh, this communal life. So she never denied her um, political origins. And uh, on the other hand, she was really conscious, as previously said, of the importance of the documentation. So uh, it's really interesting that she chose, she divided her archives in different parts and she chose to donate some of uh, her uh, reports, for instance, on the Bonfart camp in Marseille and the Kilse, uh, pogrom Kilse to, Memorial de la, to the Memorial de la Shoah. For the political actions, she donates her reports to uh, the uh, uh, Contemporary International uh, Center Archives in Paris. So she was really uh, conscious of uh, uh, the importance uh, of the, her work uh, for the historiography and for the, uh, the, the future generation. And she really liked to uh, talk with young people and to uh, and to tell uh, the story. Yeah, uh, if there are no other questions, I think, uh, yeah, we had a wonderful panel. Uh, uh, thank you to all the presentations. And I think you want to give some remarks on like, uh, the next, <laughs> like, we have a break now.